Uh, statements by members, déclaration de député. The honourable member for Spadina, Fort York. Madam Speaker, last week, my friend and World War II veteran, Mr. Fred Arsenault, passed away in Toronto at the age of 101. A member of the Cape Breton Highlanders, Fred fought in campaigns across Europe, including the battles of Ortona and Monte Cassino in Italy, and in the liberation of the Netherlands. In one battle, Fred was buried alive by a shell blast, but soldiered on with his comrades. For Fred's 100th birthday, his son took to social media to ask for 100 birthday cards for his dad. Fred received over 120,000 from across the globe, and the family continues to receive more. Fred would make the annual pilgrimage to Ottawa for the National Members Day ceremony for as long as he could. Mr. Madam Speaker, Fred's family asked me to pass on a message that we as a nation never forget the sacrifice of their father and of Canada's greatest generation. Also, that we cherish the time we have left with those who wore the uniform of our nation with pride and honour, to visit them and to listen to their stories, lest we ever forget what they endured for Canada and all Canadians. Thank you, Fred, and stand easy. Your watch has ended. The Honourable Member for Scarborough North. Madam Speaker, tomorrow Canadians of East Asian descent will gather with family and friends to celebrate the Lunar New Year and welcome the Year of the Tiger. Symbolizing energy and enthusiasm, passion and positivity, the Tiger will bring important virtues to support Canada's pandemic recovery. Over the past year, Canadians of East Asian descent have worked on the front lines in the fight against COVID-19. In Scarborough North, organizations like the Chinese Cultural Centre of Greater Toronto have hosted vaccine clinics, held for forums to combat anti-Asian hate and handed out PPE and meals to those in need. Allow me this opportunity to recognize the CCC's founding chairman, Dr. Ming Tat Chung, who was recently awarded the Chinese Peace Prize for his humanitarian service. As Canadians, let us all continue to show care and compassion for one another in the months ahead. Bonne et heureuse nouvelle année lunaire. Happy New Lunar Year. For Calgary Centre. $500 billion. That's the amount the oil and gas industry has contributed to Canadian governments in tax revenue over the past 20 years. Canadians have spent the same amount of money, half a trillion dollars, importing oil at world prices from foreign suppliers over the past 30 years without any meaningful contribution to Canadian tax revenues. So when I hear the word subsidized, being applied to Canada's oil and gas industry, it makes me wonder. Mr. Speaker, subsidized and half a trillion dollars of contributions do not reconcile. Surely, no informed Canadian would repeat such a nonsensical narrative. When false narratives marginalize this contribution, we need to ask, how do we replace $500 billion? Canadians enjoy a great standard of living. Our environmental protection and our social programs are the envy of the world. And what makes that possible? $500 billion from our responsible Canadian oil and gas sector. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Scarborough Rouge Park. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, I rise to honour the extraordinary life of Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Archbishop Tutu was a shining light for hope and justice around the world. He risked his life to champion human rights and advocate for peace and racial equality in his beloved South Africa and was instrumental in the fight to end apartheid. As chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in a post-apartheid South Africa, he compassionately led the healing process after the traumatic set of events that tore his country apart. He laughed, cried, loved and led his people to a better place. He taught us to forgive but never to forget. Amongst his many awards was the Nobel Prize for Peace in 1984. On a personal note, as we mark the end of Tamil Heritage Month in Canada, I want to recognize and thank Archbishop Tutu for his unwavering support of the Tamils' right to self-determination and his solidarity towards all oppressed peoples around the world. Thank you, Archbishop Tutu. The Honourable Member for Montcalm. Monsieur le Président, nous sommes au cœur de la Semaine nationale. Mr. Speaker, this is National Suicide Prevention Week, and it's more important than ever to talk about it. As we are all going through a difficult time together, talking about suicide saves lives. We are all at wit's end, all of us. 
isolated seniors, people living alone, our children, who are making so many sacrifices, our caregivers. But we must remember that we are in this together. We are not alone. Mr. Speaker, public health restrictions are being lifted to a certain extent this week. We are going to get to the end of winter again. But if you don't see the end, if you don't see how you're going to get through it, speak up. Talk to your loved ones. Ask for help. You'd be surprised what a difference it can make. You'd be surprised to find out how much you are loved. You'd be surprised to see how much of the support you need is available. Talk about it. You will be heard. The Honourable Member from Madawaska, Restigouche. Monsieur le Président, aujourd'hui marque le premier jour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today marks the first day of the year that the House of Commons resumes its work. I would like to take this opportunity to wish all my colleagues and all of Canada a happy new year in 2022, filled with cooperation and an end to the current pandemic. I'd also like to welcome all the newcomers who are fulfilling their dream of settling in Canada. I would like to thank them for bringing us their know-how and participating in the development of our society. Finally, I'd be remiss if I did not mention the birth of a very special little girl in this new year, a little Acadian girl who was already the pride of her first-time grandparents, my wife and I. To the parents, Marie-Claude and Dominique, congratulations on your first child. And to little Maeve Savoie Arsenault, as well as all the children of Canada, we can only wish you a bright future in this beautiful and vast country and that you will, in turn, be able to make of Canada a country that matches your dreams. Thank you. Honourable Member for Edmonton West. Here. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to recognize the outstanding community service of my friend Linda Roussel. In 1992, Linda founded Kids on Track, a community organization in Edmonton West that provides hope, direction, and ongoing support for children and their parents. Starting with just three families and 17 children at the first meeting, the program has grown to serve over 25,000 children over the years. They mentor at-risk children, host summer camps, summer camps for the less privileged, serve gala holiday dinners for their families, and host Mother Day teas for single moms. Linda recently retired as executive director after three decades of service to families. Thanks to her, thousands and thousands of stronger children and stronger families, once at risk, are now thriving. Linda, thank you for your service to so many thousands of families. Enjoy your retirement. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, it's been nearly two years since we entered a global pandemic and COVID has affected Canadians in countless ways. It's affected our economy, it's completely changed the way that we socialize, it's affected our well-being, our health, and of course our mental health. Plus que jamais, les Canadiens ont l'impression que... More than ever, Canadians have the impression that their mental health has hit its limit, and that's normal considering the circumstances. Mr. Speaker, I want Canadians to know that they are not alone. Sometimes it's difficult to admit that we need help. But it's important to realize that everyone goes through hard times. Experiencing a low and are struggling with your mental health, keep in mind that these feelings are temporary. Better days are coming. Warmer, more enjoyable days are coming. Please reach out to someone if you trust and ask for help. And if you don't feel ready to open up to someone you know, please make use of the new Pocketwell app that was launched just a couple of weeks ago. Through this app, you can regularly check in with yourself to see how you're doing, and you can gain access to free counseling. Together, we will get through this. The Honourable Member for Pierre Fondelard. Happy New Year. Ce 1er février, le Canadien d'origine chinoise et d'origine asiatique célèbre le nouvel an en lunaire. The new lunar year is being celebrated. The year of the tiger. The tiger is known for its raw power and impressive bravery. This is meant to inspire energy and positivity, qualities we can all embrace as we enter this new year. Since the beginning of Canada's history, Canadians of Asian origin have been instrumental in building the Canada we know and love today. These contributions continue today in so many ways. De Montréal à Vancouver. Toronto. From Montreal to Vancouver, Toronto and Edmonton, from Quebec to Moose Jaw see over a dozen Chinatowns across Canada. Let's do everything we can to make sure these vibrant neighborhoods and symbols of multiculturalism are preserved and strongly supported. 
So on the eve of the Year of the Tiger, as families gather together, I wish everyone positivity and prosperity. Merci beaucoup. The Honourable Member for Cumberland Colchester. It's January 19th, the sun is shining, but the temperatures are chilly, minus 18 degrees in the community of Spring Hill in my great riding of Cumberland Colchester. You see a little black cat outside in your backyard, and you say, I'm going to go out and greet my furry little friend. What started as an innocent encounter turned into an heroic event when 13-year-old Nolan Smith and his 19-year-old bro brother Nicholas acted quickly to save an elderly neighbour who had fallen outside in her backyard. Okay. Nolan was the first to notice the distressed woman lying next door. He alerted his brother and they both went to her aid. They helped her into her home and proceeded to warm her up. 911 was called and she was taken to the hospital where it was determined she had broken her pelvis. She is currently recovering in hospital, and we wish her a speedy recovery. If it were not for the efforts of these brave young men, who knows what may have transpired? Their decisive actions saved her life. Please join me in thanking these heroes and the spirit of Cumberland Colchester, which they represent. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank all MP constituent staff across the country, including my team in Nickel Belt, for helping older adults. There are many benefits in support the financial well-being of people aging. That's why last week, MP for Sudbury and I hosted an online information session for local older adults. I want to thank Barb, Sherry, Bob, and the entire Greater Sudbury Advisory Panel, representing over 110 organizations and the hundreds of dedicated volunteers. Merci aux nombreux bénévoles communautaires. Thank you to the many community volunteers who help our seniors. Thank you to the Azilda and Chemsford. Hanmer, Onaping Falls, Killarney, Gogama, St. Charles, Lions Club, Richelieu, and legions who support seniors. Thank you to First Nations in Wanapate, Matagami, and elsewhere. Thank you for helping to reach out to isolated seniors. I encourage you to go and support a senior. <laughs> The Honourable Member for Kenora. Mr. Speaker, last week a report by the Canadian Medical Association Journal linked substandard housing in remote First Nations to health problems in children. Overcrowding, poor ventilation, structural damage and mould are far too common in housing on First Nations in northwestern Ontario. Children living in these homes were found to have high rates of respiratory illnesses and hospitalizations, Mr. Speaker. It's something that Indigenous leaders and community residents have been saying for years. And it's why Canada's Conservatives have been advocating for immediate action to end this housing crisis. Today I want to echo the report's uh, calls to, to increase the housing stock and improve existing homes in First Nations, as well as its calls uh, for action on food insecurity, unsafe drinking water and the need to create economic opportunities on reserve. Mr. Speaker, Indigenous communities have been neglected and underfunded for far too long. The government must take action now. The Honourable Member for Kamloops, Thompson Caribou. Mr. Speaker, I watched with horror on Saturday when a very few protesters disrespected and desecrated the tomb of the unknown soldier. I condemn these actions unequivocally. The people who did this missed a clear point. The unknown soldier and all of those who served for this country served so that we could have the very freedoms we enjoy today, like the right to peaceful assembly and the right to free speech. This is why the use of Nazi and other racialized symbolism is so repugnant. Our soldiers fought against those things, both literally and metaphorically, so that we as Canadians could be free. And that freedom was abused by the actions of a few. So I visited the tomb of the unknown soldier this morning, not just to remember, not just to say thank you, but to beg for forgiveness for any time that we as Canadians have forgotten that freedom wasn't free. For those who laid flowers at the tomb and at the Terry Fox statue, thank you. 
For those who desecrated sacred places this weekend, shame on you. The Honourable Member for Parkdale High Park. Mr. Speaker, the situation on Ukraine's eastern border is simply unacceptable. Let's be clear. Russia under Vladimir Putin is the aggressor here. It is Russia that invaded Crimea and illegally annexed it in 2014. It is Russia that invaded the Donbass and has been waging war against Ukraine for the past eight years. And it is Russia that is engaging in cyber warfare and has unilaterally amassed one, over 100,000 troops on Ukraine's border. This Russian troop buildup must stop. Canada will remain steadfast in its support of Ukraine's sovereignty and its territorial integrity. This means protecting Ukraine's unfettered right to seek access to NATO, to defend its own borders, and to build its economy. This is why two of our cabinet ministers have been in Kiev in the past 14 days. This is why we have delivered over $120 million in sovereign loans to Ukraine, and why we have not only renewed but expanded Operation Unifier. Any further Russian invasion into Ukrainian territory will be met with sanctions, economic sanctions. We will not waver in our defense of Ukraine. Slava Ukraini. The Honorable Member for Algoma, Manitoulin, Kapiskasing. Mr. Speaker, I rise to pay tribute to an extraordinary individual who left us suddenly on January 10th while working from home. Jamie Burgess was my legislative assistant. and the first employee I hired when I was elected to this house in 2008. <laughs> ja Sorry. Jamie was a mainstay on Parliament Hill for over 20 years, having worked for the likes of former NDP MP Ian Angus, Rob Murphy, and Bill Blakey. His aptitude and experience always left us in awe. Jamie was opinionated, generous, and eager to share his knowledge and talent. His colleagues and friends and family appreciated openness, dedication, quirky sense of humor, and his passion for life. We are all devastated by his passing, and our hearts go out to his family who he cherished so much. On behalf of my team and NDP colleagues, I extend our deepest condolences to the love of his life, Kim, and his sons, Owen and Darcy, whom he was so proud of. Being the political junkie that he was, no doubt he is watching from above while sitting in the boat fishing and playing his guitar. Rest in peace, my friend. We sure do miss you. Tight lines. L'honorable député de Laurenti de la Belle. <coughs> Monsieur le Président, aujourd'hui... Mr. Speaker, today, I would like to honor a great historian and an educator who never ceases to tell us this, the history of the Laurentians. Michel Allard was born in Montreal, across from Parc La Fontaine. At the age of 81 today, he's still very active. He lived in my writing of Laurent de la Belle for 44 years. He has written more than 30 books, both historical and educational, and he taught for 37 years. Since his retirement, he continues to reveal our history through many television shows broadcast on Nou TV, Kojiko's community television. His most recent series is Mémoire du passé, or Memory of the Past. It's the history of 32 municipalities, val de La Minerve, Saint-Sauveur, Saint-Adèle, mont tremblant and 28 others. These programs are considered to be an important contribution to the popularization of our history. Mr. Allard, thank you for your work, and long life to you. The Honourable Member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands, and Rideau Lakes. Under this Liberal Prime Minister, the price of everything has gone up. The cost of basic necessities for life in Canada, like home heating, groceries, gas, have all skyrocketed at rates we haven't seen in 30 years. Well, the Liberals have been blaming everything under the sun for soaring prices. They only have to look in the mirror to find the culprits. When the Liberals formed gover government, the average price of a home was $434,500, and now it's 
It's $811,700. That's over 85% inflation in just six years under this Liberal Prime Minister. Now we have the second most inflated housing bubble in the world. People in my community, they're feeling the pinch. Young people, working class Canadians and the poor have all had their dreams of home ownership stripped away by a silver spoon fed and out of touch Prime Minister. The Prime Minister has made life unaffordable. So when you empty your bank account, buying groceries or gas, remember that it's just inflation. The Honourable Member for Mississauga, Aaron Mills. Mr. Speaker, five years ago, an act of hate took the lives of Ibrahima, Mamadou, Khalid, Abu Bakr, Abdul Karim, and Azadine in Quebec City. Seven months ago, another act of hate took the lives of the Afzal family in London, Ontario. On Saturday, the first National Day of Remembrance and Action Against Islamophobia, we recognize that prejudice is the link between these attacks and more. When everyday Islamophobia is normalized, it builds and eventually spills over into violence. Our government continues to take action in combating discrimination, including by, building, by bringing governments and communities together for a national summit on Islamophobia and committing to the important work ahead. Mr. Speaker, hate and prejudice are poisons that threaten the fabric of our society. Every one of us must stand against hate wherever and however it may appear without hesitation, because we know the consequences if we don't. Je me souviens, Mr. Speaker. I will remember, Mr. Speaker. Oral questions. Question oral, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to begin by sending best wishes to the Prime Minister and his children that are dealing with COVID-19. As a family that had COVID in the home, I wish them a speedy recovery. Here, here. Here, here. Canadian manufacturers. <laughs> Canadian manufacturers, the Federation of Independent Business, the Chamber of Commerce, the Conservative Opposition, thousands of truckers for over a month have proposed solutions to the trucking shortage in Canada and the supply chain crisis, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister has ignored this crisis, and even worse, he calls names for people that are raising these very issues. So, Mr. Speaker, my question is simple. Will the Prime Minister move past the division and agree to meet with some of the truckers impacted by his federal regulations? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the science is very clear. The best way through this pandemic is to get people vaccinated. That's how we end the disruptions to our supply chains caused by this global pandemic. That's how we get back to the things we love to do. That's why we've been unequivocal on the need to get vaccinated. And great news, Canadians across the country stepped up. Almost 90% of Canadians are vaccinated, including almost 90% of truckers, because we know that the biggest disruption to our supply chains happens uh, when people catch COVID. That's why vaccinations are the way through it, and we're going to continue to be unequivocal about that. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, when you ignore and divide a country when it needs to be united, that's not leadership, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister knows that the voices of a few don't represent the millions of Canadians who are worried. Millions of Canadians over two years have seen their lives upended, their children's mental health impacted, businesses fail, Mr. Speaker, the nation being stretched in our social fabric. Vaccines are critically important, but as the Prime Minister's own COVID diagnosis demonstrates after three vaccinations, we have to use all tools, Mr. Speaker, to get our life back to normal. When is life getting back to normal, Mr. Speaker? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. I know, and all Canadians know, how frustrating it is to have to deal with this pandemic uh, for now two years uh, and ongoing. Uh, but Canadians also have never been so united in stepping up. Almost 90% of Canadians have been vaccinated, and that means uh, they are protecting our frontline health workers. They are making sure that we're getting through this as best we possibly can. It is that unity of Canadians, that 
nature that we have of being there for each other that has been on such display through this pandemic. Uh, yes, there are people who are still hesitant, and yes, there are people... Leader of the Opposition. Monsieur le Président, depuis plus d'un mois... Mr. Speaker, for more than a month, the Chamber of Commerce, the Conservative Opposition, and thousands of Canadians, among others, have been asking for fairer policies to fix the trucker shortage and the supply chain issues. The pandemic has changed now that we're two years in, with vaccines, rapid tests, and other tools. What is the Prime Minister waiting for before using all necessary tools to help us get back to a normal life? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. We all agree that we want to end COVID. We are all exhausted from COVID-19. That is why we want to use our best tool available, vaccines. Unequivocally, people need to get vaccinated to protect themselves, to protect our healthcare workers, and to get the economy and, the, and our supply chains back on track. We are also using other tools, but the best tool is vaccines, and that is what we are putting forward, unlike the Conservative opposition, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Ukraine is an important friend and ally to Canada. Our friends in Ukraine are facing the risk of a Russian invasion as Russian troops gather at their border. Ukrainians have seen this story before, Mr. Speaker, in Crimea. Other NATO allies are delivering the military aid that Ukraine is requesting to help defend themselves. Why won't this Liberal government answer the call from our friends in Ukraine? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Exactly what we've done in standing up for Ukraine unequivocally, uh, not just right now, but have been for the past many years. In my numerous conversations with President Zelensky, uh, in the engagements that our ministers have had in the region, we have been listening to Ukraine in terms of what they most need. Obviously, we need to continue the extraordinary trading mission that Canadians have been part of for many, many years and even increase it. And also, uh, we continue to deliver the aid, whether it's uh, monetary uh, or military, uh, that they need. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Monsieur le Président, l'Ukraine est l'un des amis. Mr. Speaker, Ukraine is one of Canada's friends and allies. Our Ukrainian friends are facing the risk of a Russian invasion at the border. Other NATO, NATO allies are providing the assistance requested by Ukraine. We need to help Ukraine to avoid the scenario we've seen in Crimea. Why isn't this Liberal government responding to Ukraine's requests? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. On the contrary, Mr. Speaker, we are responding to the requests of our Ukrainian friends. We will always stand with them against Russian aggression. That is why we have expanded and extended the unified mission to train Ukrainian forces. And that is why we have also sent $120 million in assistance, and we are also doing what uh, President Zelensky and others have requested. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Mr. Speaker, you would have to have your head in the sand to not see that things are degenerating. Downtown Ottawa is closed. The bridges are closed. Members elected by thousands of Canadians and Quebecers are having a hard time getting to Parliament. Millions of people, rather. There are thousands of people, mainly truckers, but also others with other concerns who are protesting. But the problem is that these measures are necessary to get out of the pandemic. This is an impasse, Mr. Speaker. And we cannot afford to stay in this situation. What will the Prime Minister do to end this crisis? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we will, of course, always support people's right to protest against government policies, but we will also be extremely firm in standing against violence and hatred, which we have also seen in this protest. The police services are there to protect people as much as possible. But what we really need is for people to go home. Their message has been heard, and we will continue to use vaccines to help people. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Mr. Speaker, 
It is not just the protesters who are at the end of their rope. Everyone is. Healthcare professionals are at the end of their rope. People who were alone during the holidays. Sectors of our economy who don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. People are exhausted, Mr. Speaker. We understand why people are angry and frustrated. But everyone knows that hatred is not the solution. But repeating that doesn't actually get us anywhere. What will this government do concretely to get us out of this crisis? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, we will continue doing what we've done from the very beginning. We will be there to support Canadians and do whatever it takes for as long as it takes. We will be there with vaccines. We have sent a large amount of support to provincial health care systems. We have supported seniors, workers and others who are vulnerable. Our government was there with eight out of ten dollars spent to help Canadians throughout the pandemic. And we will continue to be there with solutions, principally vaccines, to help us get through this crisis. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We saw some really hateful and disturbing images coming out of the convoy in Ottawa this past weekend. We saw the Nazi flag being flown, the Confederate flag being flown. And instead of denouncing and making it clear that this type of hate has no place in Canada, the leader of the official opposition and his Conservative MPs left the door open to this type of hate in Canada. What is the Prime Minister going to do to tackle the rise of online hate so we can build a better future for our kids? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. I thank the leader of the NDP for uh, bringing up this important issue. Obviously, uh, like him, we uh, vigorously condemn uh, the hatred, the intolerance that we've seen uh, in the streets of Ottawa over the past, uh, past number of days. We know all Canadians are frustrated, all Canadians are tired of this pandemic, but the vast majority of Canadians know that listening to science, getting vaccinated, continuing to be there for each other with respect and openness is the best and really only way through this pandemic. That's what we'll stay focused on. Honourable member for Burnaby South. When I view these images... Mr. Speaker, we have seen hateful images coming out of the convoy this weekend. Instead of clearly denouncing them, the leader of the opposition and his Conservative MPs have left the door open to that type of hate. What will the PM do? to tackle the rise of hate, online hate, and what will he do to build a better future for our children? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government will stand with the vast, vast majority of Canadians who have made sacrifices, who are tired of COVID-19, but who are continuing to respect each other and who are continuing to be there for each other for healthcare workers and for essential workers. Those are the people who are showing us how we will get through this pandemic. And we will focus on them. The Conservative Party will need to reflect on how it's been showing irresponsible leadership these days. Tim Hills. Mr. Speaker, the government of Ukraine has requested lethal defensive weapons from this government. Many of our allies, including the United States, the United Kingdom, Poland and the Czech Republic all have granted this request and have supplied lethal defensive weapons. The Prime Minister has refused this request. Why? The Honourable Minister of Foreign Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When I was in Ukraine a week ago, President Zelensky made one ask to make sure that we would help by offering a sovereign loan to the Ukraine government to make sure to deal with economic instability. Three days later, we provided $120 million in sovereign loan. What I heard from the National Guard on site in Ukraine is they needed more support in terms of military training. A week later, we extended and expanded Operation Unifier. The Honourable Member for Wellington, Halton Hills. Mr. Speaker, diplomacy not backed by credible threats of the use of military force is nothing more than empty talk and rhetoric. Canada should be joining our other democratic allies and working in a multilateral fashion with our NATO partners to, to grant Ukraine's request and provide lethal defensive weapons. When will this government quit being so naive about its foreign policy 
and ensure that it counters the threats coming from authoritarian regimes like Russia. Well, Minister. Mr. Speaker, we're steadfast in supporting Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. Let me quote NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg. Canada is one of the lead countries in NATO when it comes to providing support for Ukraine. He also said there are not many countries at equal level of efforts doing as much as Canada. We will continue to work with our NATO allies and make sure that the situation de-escalates. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, the events at the Russia-Ukraine border are concerning to all Canadians who care about peace in the world. Unfortunately, Canada is seeing its international reputation tarnished. This morning, in La Presse, a diplomat posted abroad didn't mince words when he said that the current approach is amateurism that is feared by fueled by complacency. There's a real lack of seriousness. When will this prime minister finally take the tragic situation in Ukraine seriously? The Honourable Minister of Global Affairs. Mr. Speaker, we will not be taking any lessons from the Conservatives. And instead, we'd hope, we'd hope that this entire House will support us regarding Ukraine. We need to send a strong message to Russia. Russia is the aggressor here, and we will stand with the Ukrainian people. That is why we are investing a great deal of energy through all channels of diplomacy, whether with the U.S., whether with NATO, within the Normandy Group, with Germany and France. The Honorable Member for Louis saint -Laurent. That's a lot of words, Mr. Speaker, but what Ukrainian wants is real action. And in La Presse, this diplomat, Canadian diplomat posted abroad, said that the government is sticking everything on its imaginary soft power, an approach that is focused almost exclusively on image and communications rather than concrete actions. It keeps preaching to everyone about our Canadian values, and it keeps using press release diplomacy. Ukrainians want more than press releases. They want concrete and effective action from the government of Canada. When will the Prime Minister take this crisis seriously? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, once again, we won't be taking lessons from the Conservative Party on this, especially since when they were in power, they made major cuts in all sorts of missions abroad. We are showing leadership on this issue. I was in Ukraine barely a week ago. My colleague, the Minister for Defense, is currently there. And we will work with the Ukrainian government. We will be there to tell the government, the Russian government, that if they go ahead with another Ukrainian invasion, there will be grave consequences. For South Surrey, White Rock. Mr. Speaker, the Russians are ready for war with Ukraine. They've moved over 100,000 troops surrounding Ukraine's borders. The Russians have moved blood supplies to their field hospitals. This government has pulled back our op unifier trainers west of the Dnieper River. Can the minister tell this parliament if that means the government considers a diplomatic solution unlikely and a Russian invasion of Ukraine is now imminent? Great question. The Honourable Minister of Foreign Affairs. Obviously, we take the threat of a further Russian invasion very seriously. And that's why there are two paths to stop, for, to stop Russia to further invade Ukraine. The first one is the diplomatic one. And that's why we're, waiting, we're, wait, we're working sorry, with NATO, US, and Normandy format, which is France and Germany. But also, we're working on deterrence. That's why also we extended and expanding, exp expanded Operation Unifier, and also we have prepared a, an array of uh, different economic sanctions against Russia should they further invade. Thank you. November 1st, South Surrey, White Rocks. Mr. Speaker, Ukraine will likely be the scene of a large conventional ground war. We have watched this Russian military buildup in Belarus, Russia, Donbass, and Crimea since the Russian Zapad exercises last September. The government had months to prepare a robust military aid package to Ukraine. When will the Minister of Defense prove, uh, 
sorry, when will the Minister of Defence provide the lethal weapons that Ukraine needs now? The Honourable Minister. As mentioned before, uh, Mr. Speaker, we've already answered the call on the part of the Ukrainian government by expanding and extending Operation Unifier. I was there a, a week ago and met with the military, the Canadian Armed Forces on site, which comes from Val Quartier right now, Quebec City. And I saw on the ground how much the National Guard is thankful to Canadians to make sure that we're providing the right support to the military and the National Guard. And we've trained more than 30,000 National Guards and Armed Forces in Ukraine since 2014. Thank you. The Honourable Member for saint hyacinthe bagot Mr. Speaker, people are exhausted. We are all upset about the Omicron variant, but this is not the time to give up. This is the time to push ahead and finish the pandemic once and for all. We see that with Omicron, things won't be over until the entire planet is vaccinated. We can't get out of this crisis without global vaccination. What is this government doing to speed up global vaccination so that we don't have to go through another winter under lockdown? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my colleague for raising this important matter. COVID won't be going anywhere until the entire planet isn't vaccinated. And that is why since the beginning of COVID, Canada has been one of the most important stakeholders with creating the COVAX procedure, which enabled us from the beginning to invest quickly in the development, but also the delivery and delivery support of tens of millions of vaccines. And that was the right thing to do. The Honourable Member for saint hyacinthe bagot Mr. Speaker, People have been getting their third doses. They are doing their part. But they don't want to be told that we have enough vaccines for a possible fourth dose. What they want to hear is that the pandemic is over. And to accomplish that, we need to vaccinate the whole world. Two weeks ago, I heard the government celebrate that COVAX had a billion doses. But there are more than three billion people in the world who still haven't had their first dose. Does this government understand that half measures are not enough? The Honourable Minister. As my uh, uh, honorable colleague had mentioned, the COVID-19 pandemic does not recognize borders and will only be overcome through coordinated global um, uh, action. And this is why Canada stepped up, um, Mr. Speaker. We are committed to, to do no donating the equivalent of at least 200 million COVID-19 vaccines. We are committed to supporting the equitable global access to COVID-19 vaccines. This includes therapeutics and diagnostics as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Deputy de saint hyacinthe The Honorable Member for saint hyacinthe bagot Mr. Speaker, it's simple. We are running out of time. If 70% of the global population doesn't have its vaccines within six months, we are at risk of another wave and getting into another crisis. Time is running out. Last month, the, a human development VP at the World Bank confirmed that at this stage, it is not clear that that objective will be met. Currently, the world vaccination campaign is moving towards a failure. What will Canada do to fix the situation now to finish this pandemic once and for all? I'd like to get an answer, please. Mr. Speaker, as we stated, Canada is st stepping up to provide uh, uh, um, vaccines for the global community. That's why our government committed $2.6 million in commitment to the uh, COVID-19 response, which includes $1.3 billion for the uh, Acti Accelerator, of which $545 million is for COVAX. Over $740 million is for humanitarian and development as assistance, Mr. Speaker. I could not agree more with, with the member that uh, all of us in the world needs to be vaccinated for, uh, for all of us to be safe. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Portage Lisker. Mr. Speaker, all Canadians want to see a leader who will work to heal rifts, not further divide. A leader who will listen, even to those voices he might not agree with. A leader who will work to understand, not dismiss, name call and gaslight. Contrary to some, there are thousands of passionate, patriotic and peaceful Canadians on the Hill right now who just want to be heard. Will the Prime Minister extend an olive branch and will he listen? The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, 
Speaker, I think we all uh, support free speech in this House, but there's a big difference between free speech and inciting hatred, inciting violence, desecrating war memorials, Mr. Speaker. And I would hope my honourable colleague would denounce that in the clearest terms, Mr. Speaker. Those radical leaders are not really interested in free speech because they want to pretend as those vaccines don't work. On this side of the House, we know vaccines work. That's the gateway to freedom. And this government will do everything that we can to get there. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Portage Lisker. Of course, we all condemn hateful and destructive acts by a few at any protest. Whether it's beheading the statue of Queen Victoria in Manitoba, tearing down the statue of Sir John A. in Montreal, or putting flags on Terry Fox, whether it's burning churches, whether it's wearing blackface, whether it's Hezbollah flags or Nazi flags, we all condemn it. Mr. Speaker, let's be abundantly clear that those individuals who've called for the incitement of violence to overthrow this government, who have caused significant disruption by flagrantly ignoring public health care measures that have forced shops and businesses to close, that have desecrated war memorials, are not interested in free speech, they're not interested in discourse, and they're certainly not interested in advancing our way out of this pandemic, Mr. Speaker. This government will always listen to those who want to have a robust debate about public health care measures, but we have to draw a bright line between those who are interested in that debate and those who are not. Well, that, that minister is not telling the truth, and it's shameful to see what he is doing. Accusing Canadians Order, order, order. I think both sides are very truthful in saying what they say. Whether they agree with it or not is something that is another story. But calling someone who's tell, well, basically t calling them a name or accusing them of something is not permitted in the House. I'll let the Honourable Member for Portage Lister start from the top, and I'm sure she'll ask the question uh, correctly. Mr. Speaker, and I apologize that that minister is misleading Canadians. I do get very defensive of Canadians who are outside today, patriotic, peace-loving Canadians who are called misogynist and racist by the Prime Minister. Black so again, Prime I will Minister. ask the Prime Minister, who may I remind this House wore blackface yeah. on more times than he can remember, apologize to the peace-loving, patriotic Canadians who are outside right now just asking to be heard. Will he speak to them? The Honourable uh, Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I think this is a moment uh, where we have to acknowledge that the protests that have occurred have made their point. And I would ask the member opposite to encourage the people that are outside to continue in a way that is peaceful, that moves beyond what we have seen. Ottawa is being paralyzed right now. We're seeing imagery that's not appropriate. I'm going to ask the Honourable Minister to hold on for a second. I, I, I'm sure the Honourable Member for Portage Lisker wants to hear an answer to the question she asked. Uh, uh, no, I'll, I'll let the Honourable Minister continue from where he, le from where he, where he left off. Just say this, Mr. Speaker. I, I was in opposition. I was in opposition for about seven years. And, I, and there were times where I was uh, overheated in my rhetoric. There were moments where I got too carried away with what I believed passionately at the time. There is a moment where we need to de-escalate. There's a moment where we need to bring it down. And I'm asking the members opposite, instead of going outside with these protests, to... The Honourable Member for North Island, Powell River. Mr. Speaker, Canadians are struggling. The cost of groceries are going up, gas and heating are getting more and more expensive, and the price of housing is soaring. In a recent poll, 60% of Canadians said they were having difficulty feeding their families. Liberals are not making it better for Canadians, especially vulnerable seniors who are being told that they must wait months longer for their GIS payment. When will this government help hardworking Canadians who are struggling every day just to get by? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. 
speaker, I would like to thank the member opposite for her important question. And we absolutely appreciate that there are many Canadians, particularly vulnerable seniors, facing affordability challenges. In the fall economic update, we presented our government's plan to support those seniors with a one-time payment. We will be there for those seniors who need our support. And I want to thank and congratulate all the Canadians who are behind Canada's very robust economic recovery from the COVID recession. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Elmwood Transcona. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And the, the problem with that answer, just as the problem with the Minister's announcement in the fall economic statement, is that it does not in any way do justice to the urgency of those seniors that have lost their home now because the government decided to claw back their guaranteed income supplement and aren't getting any relief. So they're out on the street, they're freezing in the cold. We've heard reports of people who have already lost their life. And the fact of the matter is, is that waiting until May isn't good enough. It's why we joined with Campaign 2000 to call for an emergency payment for those people and also to make sure that there's a fund to get them housed right away, not in May. So when's the, the Honourable <laughs> Minister? Mr. Speaker, I think we can all agree just how challenging this pandemic has been on senior, particularly those most vulnerable. And that is why, Mr. Speaker, we worked extremely hard to strengthen income security for seniors, including the uh, increases to the GIS. That has helped over 900,000 low-income seniors, Mr. Speaker. We also know seniors who access income, income supports uh, because they needed it during this crisis, and they shouldn't be penalized for it now. And that's why we're making a major investments through a one-time payment for those seniors affected. We've always been there for Mr. For seniors, Mr. Speaker, will always continue to have their backs. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Mississauga Malton. Constituents in Mississauga Malton are worried about the rising cost of housing. They want to see federal leadership to create more affordable housing. Unfortunately, while our, our government delivers that leadership through the National Housing Strategy, Conservative Party members continued to repeat disinformation about a non-existent home equity tax in right-wing media last week. Can the Minister of Housing and Diversity and Inclusion please set the record straight again in this House on the Conservative disinformation about a home equity tax? Well, Minister of Housing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member of, for Mississauga Moulton for his important question and his advocacy on affordable housing. And I want to welcome the opportunity to remind those spreading misinformation that our government is not considering charging capital gains or surtaxes on primary residences. And any suggestion otherwise, including from the Conservative Party, is absolutely false. So while they continue to make up claims, we will focus on making sure that each and every Canadian has access to a safe and affordable place to call home. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Just because the Prime Minister dressed up in racist costumes so many times he can't remember them all. Doesn't mean every single Liberal is a racist. Just because the Prime Minister had tried to help a corporation avoid prosecution after it stole from some of Africa's poorest people, doesn't mean all Liberals are racist. Just because about a half dozen Liberal MPs who are racial minorities have complained about his treatment of them does not mean that all Liberals are racist. Exactly. That is guilt by association. Yep. Why doesn't the Prime Minister opt instead for personal responsibility? Yeah. Yeah. The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, uh, I hope that I've been clear in all of my comments that I respect the Honourable colleagues on the other side, just as I believe they respect the colleagues that are on this side and the work that we do and the people that we are. There are times in our political discourse where we see things that are abhorrent, and all I would ask is that we equally call it out. When I saw swastikas on the street, when I saw what had happened, it's time to move on. And what I would ask is instead of trying to inflame the situation, let us de-escalate the situation, let us work together to find a way to stop the lockdown that is happening of this city that, so that citizens can move forward with their lives and any legitimate grievances can be fairly heard. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Well, Mr. Speaker, I agree. We should always call out evil symbols and the individuals who are individually responsible for putting them up. I remember a January 18th, January 2018 event 
where the Prime Minister stared straight at a swastika and instead of condemning it, said thank you for coming, sir. We on this side condemn evil symbols whenever they are used. I do respect that member. I just wish his government would respect the thousands of people who are fighting for their livelihoods right now who are trying to do the best to get this country back on track. Government House we are in a time of global crisis, uh, a time when so many are being uh, adversely affected by this pandemic, and our hearts go out to every one of them. The way in which we have discourse for each other will define this moment for all of us. And to those that are peacefully protesting, I would ask that their point has been made. It's time to go home and do it a different way. That continuing to lock down this city and continuing to do what's happening, it is deeply disturbing for Canadians to see the way that this city and our symbols are being treated. And I would ask the Conservatives to also join with us to ask that they go home and let's do this responsibly. Let's have responsible dialogue. I respect the member opposite. Let's do this the right way. The Honourable Member for Colton. Well, the problem is they've, no, they've shown no respect for the people. This country right now is like a raw nerve and the Prime Minister is jumping up and down on it again and again with his inflammatory record, re rhetoric. We're talking about people who have 14-year-old kids that are suicidal after two years of lockdowns. I just spoke to a waitress whose business was wiped out by lockdowns. I'm talking to, to truckers who've been, who've been serving food on our, our plates throughout this, and these are the very people, honest, hard-working, sure-off-your-back type of people that this Prime Minister keeps attacking. The Honourable Government House Leader. We'll wait to start the time. Okay, very good. Please go. Mr. Speaker, again, I, I encourage the member um, to, to just think about if as he's talking about de escalating and having civil discourse. Uh, his tone and how he's approaching this issue. This is a time that is incredibly delicate. We are in a moment where there is a raw nerve that is being touched. How we talk to each other, Mr. Speaker, how we deal with one another. I, I'm going to interrupt the Honourable Government House Leader and just wait till everything calms down a moment and then I'll let him start from the top because I'm sorry, I didn't have a chance to hear it all and I'm sure the Honourable Member from Carleton asked a question he wanted an answer to and he wants, wants to hear it and we're just not hearing anything because of the noise. The Honourable Government House Leader, please proceed. I have, I have an instinct, and that instinct is that Canadians expect us today, when they're seeing what's happened over this weekend, to watch the dialogue in this chamber be as respectful as possible, That's for us right. to dial down Absolutely. our rhetoric and our language, for us to engage in one another and find an off-ramp from the escalation that has occurred, because this is not healthy. In a healthy democracy, we have respectful debates that don't involve some of the things that we've seen. And all I'm asking for is for us to engage in a constructive way. So if we could attempt in this place, in this hour, to be equal to that, I hope that we can move forward on that basis. Yes. Mr. Well, member for Carlton. Well, I couldn't agree more. And Mr. Speaker, I was out at an overpass as the truckers went by. And what I saw were cheerful, patriotic, optimistic Canadians who want their freedom back and want their livelihoods back. And they're standing up for their fellow Canadians, the 60% of families who fear they can't feed themselves. The 28-year-old kid living in mom's basement because he can't afford a home. The small businessman wiped out by endless lockdowns by incompetent politicians. These are the people that are standing up and fighting for their livelihoods and their freedom. Why won't the government finally stand with them? difference, uh, Mr. Speaker, I have a fundamental difference, and that is that I don't believe that my enemy is across the aisle. I believe that our enemy is this pandemic, and that our enemy is ending this pandemic and getting everybody uh, to get vaccinated and to move forward in a way where the concerns that he's talking about, being affected by a global crisis, means that they are supported. This is a time of collective trauma. It requires us to be compassionate, to work with another, and understand that our common enemy is the virus and not one another. Yes. The Honourable Member for Lac Saint Jean. Mr. Speaker, Friday will be the opening ceremony of the Beijing Olympics. The whole world will be celebrating the greatness of China, China while it's committing genocide against its own people, the Uyghurs. Mr. Speaker, we should not blame the athletes. 
they are not the ones who decided to encourage the games to be held in China. It's this government. Can this government at least have the courage to finally recognize that what is happening in China is true and that the Uyghur people are being subject to genocide? The Honorable Minister of Sport. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague for his question, which allows me to speak for the first time in this House, and thank the constituents of my riding. Mr. Speaker, the decision whether to participate in the Olympics or not in China was first and foremost up to the, the Olympic Committee and the Paralympic Committees. Athletes in other countries as well have decided to send their athletes to participate in the Chinese Olympics. The government sent a clear and coherent message. We've always defended this. We are in favor of democracy. And that is why, in cooperation with our allies, we are not sending an official delegation to China. The Honourable Member for Lac Saint Jean. Mr. Speaker, it's curious. Canada is participating in a diplomatic boycott of the Games, but they're, they're not even able to tell us why. They don't have the courage to tell us because China is committing genocide against the Uyghur people. They don't want us to enter, investigate this. They don't want us to delay or move the Games. They accept a diplomatic boycott, but they refuse to tell us why. Is this what the Prime Minister had in mind when he told the world that Canada is back? Is that what he meant by that? The Honourable Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Speaker, I take the allegations of gel gel genocide in China against the Uyghur people very seriously, and that is why we've always shared these concerns, and that is why we have decided not to send a diplomatic delegation to the Olympic Games that start Friday, and that's why we asked the Human Rights Commission at the UN to investigate the situation. So I'd like to correct my colleague when he says that we won't investigate it. That's not true. On the contrary, we want to shed full light on this issue because it's very concerning. Thank you very much. Alona Lake Country. Mr. Speaker, last month the Associate Finance Minister said that when it came to payroll tax hikes that, quote, businesses can afford this. How completely out of touch is this comment with small businesses, considering they went ahead with these tax hikes despite 30-year record high inflation rates? We have to assume this government believes that businesses can afford these as well. So to the minister, how historically high do inflation rates have to be before this government stops increasing taxes on small businesses? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to supporting small businesses, it is a bit rich of the Conservatives to presume to offer our government any advice at all. After all, before Christmas, when the Omicron wave was rising, it was these Conservatives who opposed Bill C-2, a bill which included a lockdown insurance policy for small businesses and Canadians. The Conservatives voted against it. Thank goodness they failed. Otherwise, our small businesses today would have no support. The Honourable Member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Mr. Speaker, record inflation coupled with this government's brutal GIS clawback, has financially crippled many of Canada's hardworking seniors, forced to spend their golden years in the labour market just to make ends meet. Our vulnerable seniors need to know that Ottawa is listening. That is why our Conservative opposition called on this government to reverse the CPP tax hike. Mr. Speaker, when will this government stand up, rise up, lean in to Canada's hardworking seniors and help them meet their base? Honourable uh, Minister. Worked all their lives and they deserve to feel safe and financially secure later in their life. That is why, Mr. Speaker, our government is delivering on our promise to increase the OAS by 10% for those 75 and older, strengthening the support for all Canadians later in life. Since 2015, Mr. Speaker, we have restored the age of elig eligibility for OAS to 65. We have increased the GIS for single seniors and strengthened the CPP. During the pandemic, we provided direct and immediate support for seniors, Mr. Speaker. And as always, we will be there for them.
The Honourable Member for Brantford to Brant. Mr. Speaker, with inflation reaching a 30-year high, the government continues to hurt Canadians with its poor economic policies. Nearly 60 percent of people are finding it difficult to feed their families. And if that's not bad enough, the government raised its CPP tax on Canadians, an extra $700 coming out of families' paychecks. Now, this may mean nothing to this Prime Minister, but it matters to everybody else. When will the government reverse its CPP tax and stop penalizing hardworking families? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives continue to irresponsibly perpetuate a false economic mm. narrative mm. and talk down the Canadian economy. The reality is that Canada is resilient and our economy is robustly recovering from the COVID recession. In Q3, our GDP grew by 5.4 percent. That was beating the U.S., Japan, the U.K. and Australia. We have recovered 108 percent of jobs lost to the pandemic, compared to just 84 percent in the U.S. And we had in November a trade surplus at a 13-year high. Mr. The Honourable Member for King's Hands. Monsieur le Président, en décembre. Mr. Speaker, in December, the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change announced a consultation process on our new climate commitments. The Minister also confirmed that he will table, by the end of March 2022, Canada's 2030 Emissions Reduction Plan. Can the Minister inform this House on how our government will build a strong foundation to achieve net zero by 2050. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. First, I'd like to congratulate my colleague for his ongoing efforts to speak French in this House. And our government in the past few years has invested billions in climate change efforts. and. There will be never many new components in our new legislation, including zero emission efforts, as well as a ceiling on GES emissions. King Vaughan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Many in Canada's labour force are senior citizens, struggling to get by. Many seniors are forced to work beyond the retirement age, to no fault of their own. The CPP tax hike has added insult to injury to our seniors who have worked hard their whole life. The out-of-control inflation has many working seniors feeling like retirement is a dream they will never have the ability to experience. When will this government reverse the CPP hikes for our seniors? Thank you. The Honourable Minister. Speaker, since 2015, our government has been strengthening retirement uh, support for seniors today and for future retirees. We have built a strong social net and pension system that all Canadians, Mr. Speaker, can be proud of. We have enhanced the CPP, the OAS, and raised GIS for single seniors. That has helped 900,000 low-income single seniors, Mr. Speaker. We're helping investing in services such as $70 million for New Horizons for Seniors program, billions into home care, Mr. Speaker. We're going to make sure that seniors uh, now and into the future have all the supports that they need. Thank you. Member for Edmonton Riverbend. Mr. Speaker, CMHC is a federal agency funded by this housing minister using taxpayer dollars. So recently, CMHC funds a study that determined the best course of action tax Canadian homeowners more. Now, why should Canadians be concerned about this, Mr. Speaker? Because this government continues to float the idea of adding more taxes on Canadian homeowners. On this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, we are 100 per cent against this tax. Why does this minister continue to support the idea of adding more taxes on Canadian homeowners? The Honourable Minister for Housing. It gives me another opportunity to once again state categorically that our government is not considering charging capital gains or surge taxes on primary residences. We've said this time and time again in the House of Commons and in the public sphere. And the party opposite continues to engage in misinformation, 
We are busy focused on the work of ensuring that each and every Canadian has a safe and affordable place to call home. The Honourable Member for Port Neuf Jacques Cartier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We want our businesses to believe in the future of our country and to invest and continue operating their businesses. Programs have been established to help our entrepreneurs during this crisis. But there are some companies that don't have access to this assistance when they open their businesses in July 2022. They're part of the economic recovery, but nothing is there for them. What is the Minister of Finance going to do to support these entrepreneurs and save their businesses? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, once again, I have to stress the hypocrisy of the Conservative Party. We know, well, in terms of small businesses in Canada, we saw the rise in the Omicron wave, and we established measures to help and support small businesses in Canada. The Conservatives were against such measures. I'm very happy to be able to help small businesses, and our government was able to support them against. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, we know that the vaccine is the best way to end this pandemic and to ensure the security of our communities. Board, please share with the House the steps our government is taking to safeguard the health of Canadians and Canada's air transportation system. Thank you. Honourable Minister of Transport. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank my colleague for her question. Our government is committed to the public health of our, uh, our citizens. Right. Mr. Speaker, our leadership requires belief in science. Leadership also requires resolve, and we are resolute to doing everything we can to protect the health and safety of Canadians. That's why we've implemented measures, including requiring travelers to be fully vaccinated, and any allegations of violations of our public health measures will be investigated fully by Transport Canada, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Windsor West. Mr. Speaker, like many other frontline workers, grocery store workers have put their health at risk to make sure Canadians have been able to get the essentials that they need. With COVID-19 cases high, it's absolutely essential that they are treated and compensated fairly for the work that they do. Big grocery store chains won't do the right thing on their own and restore the hero pay they had promised. They even take government handouts to pay their rich CEOs. If the Liberals won't stand up for these workers, will they at least guarantee that these fat cats won't continue to get taxpayer-subsidized money, especially when they promise to make this happen. What will the minister do? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I would like to thank the member opposite for reminding us yet again that COVID has really shown us who are the truly essential workers in our economy. And that very much includes frontline workers in places like grocery stores. Our government is very pleased to have been able to put measures in place throughout COVID to support these workers, including measures like paid sick leave, including measures like government support for people who need to take time off if a loved one is sick, and of course the increase in the Canada workers' benefit. Absolutely. The Honourable Member for Kitchener Centre. Mr. Speaker, earlier this month, over 400 climate scientists and scholars co-signed a letter calling on the federal government to step back from its plan to introduce another fossil fuel subsidy, a new tax credit for carbon capture and storage. As stated in their letter, despite decades of research, carbon capture is neither economically sound nor proven at scale. This proposal would only divert resources away from proven and cost-effective solutions like renewable energy and electrification. Can the minister confirm they will listen to scientists and scrap this proposed new subsidy? The Honourable Minister. The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Mr. Speaker, and thank you to my honourable colleague for his question. We have to look at every possible technologies that will help us reduce greenhouse gas. And in fact, when it comes to 
carbon capture and storage, the IPCC itself produced a report a few years ago looking at this very technology, saying that we might have to do it because we won't be able to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions fast enough to prevent 1.5 degrees Celsius of global warming, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. And that's all the time we have today. C'est tout le temps que nous avons aujourd'hui pour la période de questions. That's all the time we have for question period today. Do you have a no? Okay. Good. No point of order. Do you want to give me my uh, order? Excusez. Uh